Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Hello, Tampere. I'm uh, very happy to be back in Finland. I always enjoy it here. So this is my talk uh, introducing Closure Spec to you. Uh, Closure Spec is one of the most exciting things to happen in Closure Land, and um, probably in, in programming in general in a while. So I'm really happy to share with you all the cool stuff that uh, people have been working on. Uh, really briefly about me, so my name is Arne. I make screencasts about Closure at lambdaisland.com. Um, this is my job. Uh, there's 17 episodes so far, about three hours of content. Uh, you can get the monthly or quarterly yearly subscription. So if you like to continuously learning uh, cool stuff about Closure and Closure Script, but backend, frontend, web development, or if you like supporting uh, an independent creator, then check that out. You can find a discount code on uh, Twitter slash Lambda Island uh, that's still valid until Monday evening to get your first month for free. All right, so Closure Spec is a new library that's coming out in Closure 1.9. Uh, 1.9 is not out yet. It's in alpha. There's been a dozen alpha releases. Uh, so it is out in the sense that you can try it out, but things might still change between now and the official stable release. What Closure Spec does, what it gives you, is a language for describing the shape of your data. And then there are various things that you can do with that. So you write specs about what your data is supposed to look like, and then there are various things you can do. So the obvious one is to validate your data, just saying, OK, this thing, is it, does it correspond with what I want it to be? Um, then there's what is called conforming in uh, spec terminology, is uh, a way of shaping, molding, parsing data into um, a shape that's more amenable to processing. Uh, so we'll see some examples of that. You can instrument functions and macros, so you get uh, checks during development that'll warn you early on if, uh, if you're introducing bugs. Um, and then finally, and this is the really cool stuff, you can generate data based on specs, and so you can use it to drive generative testing. So I'll be looking at how to write specs, the things you can do with it. I'm going to zoom into a couple that I think are interesting types of specs. Um, I've limited time. We'll see how far uh, we can go with this. So uh, let's get started. Now, when, uh, when you start talking about closure spec, and especially if there are programmers in the room that are you know, predominantly coming from other languages, maybe Haskell or other statically typed languages, you know, somebody will go, but what about the types? Somebody think of the poor types. Um, and the thing is, Clojure is a dynamic language. Uh, that, that ship has sailed a long time ago. We like it that way. It's a trade-off. Um, but specs give us some of the things that, that types uh, give us. They also give us other things. That it's a different, you know, it's a different trade-off. Um, but it's especially interesting just to see how a dynamic language can approach this same question of eliminating certain categories of bugs. Um, and if you do want to contrast and compare, the main uh, fundamental difference is that when you have static types, you can do static analysis. You can do analysis on your code without running any code. And so at compile time, you can already detect a lot of anomalies. Whereas um, specs are uh, Closure being a dynamic language inherently checked at runtime. Um, now, Closure being a Lisp, we do have a compile step where macros are expanded. And since macros are, in a way, just functions, they can be instrumented with specs. And so you do get checks on macros uh, at compile time. And the, the, not the latest, but the, the previous alpha introduced specs for a bunch of uh, built-in macros. So now if you're abusing, say, the NS macro, in the past it would have worked just fine. Now it'll be flagged early on. So that's already a benefit, a real benefit that you can reap right now. So like I said, Closure 1.9, it's in alpha, alpha 12 at the moment. So you can put this in your project CLJ or in your build.boot. Uh, and all of the code I'm showing you, you can try out today. I'm going to, throughout this presentation, use a running example of a robot chef. So this is a buzzword-compliant, Internet of Things 
uh, device that pulls recipes from the cloud and then turns them into delicious meals. And so our robot chef uh, needs recipes. Recipes have a certain structure. Here's an example of a recipe. Uh, it has ingredients, it has steps. Uh, and you see here that I'm using namespaced keywords, and you're going to see a lot of those. Uh, people that use Datomic or, or certain libraries already make a lot of use of them, but maybe not everyone is as familiar with them. So a namespaced keyword is really nothing special. It's just a keyword containing a slash. Right, and the thing before the slash we call the namespace or the key or the prefix. Um, so the namespace, the, the prefix in the keyword might correspond with an actual existing namespace, but it doesn't necessarily have to. It doesn't have to exist, uh, correspond with an co existing namespace or, or the namespace doesn't have to be loaded. It really is just an identifier. Um, now, why do we namespace our keywords? Well, why do we namespace anything to avoid collisions? So say, uh, in HTTP, you have a request method, the, the HTTP verb, but our robot chef might also have a method, you know, you want to stir versus cook or whatever versus boil. Um, so this, if you just would use the word method, that could be ambiguous in a bigger system. So you want to be unambiguous, and so what it really boils down to is have unambiguous and stable semantics. So if you use a prefix, say the name of your library or a namespace that you control, then you get to say, what the semantics of that key are, and especially what the semantics are of whatever value corresponds with that key. Um, there is already a bunch of syntactic, na uh, syntactic sugar in Clojure right now for namespace keywords. So say this is now a REPL session. I'm in the Rob RoboChef core namespace. So I want to have the RoboChef core slash ingredients uh, keyword. I can type that out in whole or I can put colon colon ingredients and then that'll expand to a keyword in the current namespace. So purely on the syntactic level, there is a link with namespaces, just in the sense that when you're in a certain namespace, you might have a tendency to use keywords prefixed with that namespace. So they make that easy for you. Also, when you have uh, namespace aliases set up, so here I'm in the user namespace, but I have an alias RC to the RoboChef core namespace, then I can put colon colon rc slash, and that'll also expand expand to what you see at the bottom. So this we already have. Um, now it's quite common when you start using these namespaces to have maps where every single key has the same prefix. So here, say we have a recipe. Every single one of these keys starts with colon RoboChef. This gets tedious. It's repetitive. It takes a bit of the fun out of the programming, right? So. 1.9 is going to introduce a new syntax, new shorthand syntax. Uh, you can recognize uh, with the, the pound sign, the hash sign, that this is a, a reader thing. So the reader is going to expand that uh, expression you see at the bottom to the map you see at the top. Um, so that's one thing. That's where you write the code. Now, if you consume that code, what you want to do, you want to destructure this, right? Destructuring makes it a lot uh, easier to take values out of maps. Um, and destructuring with namespace keywords wasn't so easy before, but for this we also get a new syntax. So say we have the map at the top, that's a map where I'm using the new syntax now with uh, namespace keywords. Then here where you normally would put um, colon keys for destructuring, you now give keys a prefix, and then it'll pull out the values with that prefix. Does that make sense? So here I'm pulling out steps and serves and then using steps um, so this is pretty cool. This is already uh, shipped a couple of alphas ago. You can already use this if you're on 1.9. All right. Um, there was a lot of preamble, but onto the, the actual closure spec. So uh, you start by including closure spec in the closure spec namespace. I'm going to alias it as commonly as done with uh, S. And then you define specs with the def function. Now, def takes two arguments. The first one is a namespace keyword. This is the name of the spec that you're defining. And then the part after that is a spec, a spec object, a specification. Um, so I'm going to go deeper into what exactly this S keys and S star, what all that is. But basically, you can see here that I'm defining a recipe with a certain specification and ingredients as a separate spec and then steps. And so all of these are registered in a global registry by name. OK, so spec internally keeps its own register registry of all the specs that you registered. 
Now, what can, can you do with those specs? Like I said before, you can just validate data. So if I want to say, okay, is this a valid list of ingredients? Well, uh, ingredients is a list of uh, a unit, uh, a quantity, a unit, and an ingredient, which is a string. So this one is correct. And then you have this conform operation, which takes that value and kind of runs it through the spec and either gives you the same data or the same data in a slightly different shape. So you see here that what was just a, a flat vector before now becomes a vector of maps where we get uh, these keys based on keys that we put into the spec. So this, this bottom one is, is much richer and much easier to consume. So that's kind of uh, one of the nice things of, of this uh, conform operation. Now, if the data doesn't conform, if it's not valid, then valid will return false. It's just a predicate. Conform will return a special symbol, closure spec invalid. And then the question is, okay, what did we do wrong? So for this, there's the explain function which will print out on standard out uh, an error message telling you exactly which part of your data violated which part of the spec. It takes a bit of getting used to the output. Uh, it's become pluggable, so I'm guessing there will be uh, libraries coming out with, with different ways to display this information. Um, there's also variants of this function where you can get that as, as pure data or as a string versus printing it on standard out. So those are kind of the, the, the more obvious things you can do with specs. Now, what's really cool is that you can also use specs to generate data. Uh, so there's uh, an exercise function in the spec namespace. Here I'm telling it to generate two ingredient lists for me. Um, and so it, it returns a seek of pairs. And the first item in the pair is the generated data. And the second item in the pair is the generated data but conformed. So you can see here, well, the empty list, that's a valid, uh, valid list of ingredients. This list here, zero high zero, that's also a valid list. And then if you would run that through spec conform, you would get this. And so you can basically generate an infinite amount of valid data, run that through your tests, do, do cool stuff with it. Um, if uh, there's time, I get back to that all the way at the bottom, at the, at the, at the end. So um, I've kind of been hand wavy about what exactly a spec is, but all of these functions that take a spec as their first argument can basically take one of three things. It starts with the smallest building block, which is a predicate. So just a function that returns a truthy or a falsy value um, that's the smallest, the most primitive type of spec. Given those predicates, you can start combining them using all these functions that spec gives you. So you can say it has to be either this predicate or that predicate. It has to be this and that. You can use your own predicates, your own functions. Um, you can use a map as a predicate. There you can say this needs to be a collection of something with this predicate, like a, a collection of numbers, and it needs to be a vector, stuff like that. So all of these you can use in any function that takes a spec. And if you register a spec with a certain fully qualified name, then you can just use that name wherever you would use a spec. Um, and given that it all, you know, it all starts with predicates, it's all based on these predicates, Closure 1.9 introduces a whole lot of new predicates. So most of these have to do with types. Is it a double? Is it a Boolean? Is it a URI? Uh, ident means uh, either a keyword or a symbol, and then is it qualified or not? Um, now, the cool thing is if you start using these, that then your specs will also generate the correct type of data. So if you say, okay, this here needs to be a positive integer, if you start using it to generate data, then it will only generate positive integers. So that's pretty cool. Um, there are two types of specs that I want to zoom into because I think they're, they're, you know, they're really powerful and they really show the, the big ideas behind spec. The first is keys, which are used for, for maps. And the second are re rejects, regular expression specs, which you can use to spec any type of sequence. So back to our RoboChef, um, we have a, a tomato sauce recipe here, has ingredients and steps. And so um, this is the spec that I showed you earlier for a recipe. And I'm saying that a recipe has certain keys. It, it needs to have you know, required are the ingredients, optional are the steps. Now here, where I specify the recipe, all I'm specifying is the key set and not the values that correspond with it. I'm not saying in that first definition, this is what ingredients look like. 
but I'm making separate specs for ingredients and for steps. So um, what Rich Hickey says about that is uh, most systems for specifying structures conflate the specification of the key set with the specification of the values designated by those keys. This is a major source of rigidity and redundancy. So remember that earlier I was saying, you know, by having these fully qualified keywords, we get stable semantics. So wherever that keyword occurs in a system, now or in the future, the value that corresponds with it should always be of a certain type, of a certain shape. Um, and that, that, you know, that's fixed, um, no matter what context it occurs in. So you can have uh, a similar thing occur in many different maps, and for each of these, you can have a different key specification of what keys this map is comprised of, but, but the value itself uh, gets its own spec. And so the way that works is, once you start checking this, um, say that I want to validate this recipe, what uh, spec is going to do is, it's going to look at each key and then see, do I have a registered spec with this name? And if so, it's going to validate this name, uh, this value with that spec. So if I, um, I have a spec here for ingredients, it finds a RoboChef ingredients key in this map, so the key spec will validate whatever corresponds with it as a list of ingredients. I don't know if that's clear. Maybe the next example will make it a bit more clear. The nice thing about this is that you get um, a naturally extensible system. So say our RoboChef, um, you know, we, we load a, a plugin uh, for dinner parties. And this plugin needs to add some extra information for recipes. It needs to know how many people it serves. So now we get a dinner party serves key in our map. And dinner party serves has its own spec. It needs to be a positive integer. Now, if you run this spec, if you validate this recipe, then closure spec will find that dinner party serves and says, oh, I have a spec for that. I can validate that. And if that would be 0 or minus 1, it would, it would uh, tell you that that's wrong. Even though in the recipe specification, we know nothing about that dinner party serves. So imagine, for instance, you know, with, with ring maps, you could have middleware that adds extra stuff to it with its own specification, and it would all get checked. So that's, that's a, it's a pretty powerful idea. Um, the second one that I want to briefly zoom into, and I'm already running out of time, but um, is specking sequences. So closure spec contains a con complete uh, regular expression engine. Now, you might think of regular expressions in the context of strings, um, but it's, it's actually a broader, you know, computer science concept. Uh, and strings are really just a sequence of characters. And sequences in closure are sequences of values. So we can use the same, same ideas, the same techniques, to go over that sequence, given a regular expression, and check if it conforms. Um, so you have five regular expression operators that you can mix and match. Uh, star plus and question mark are the same as in string regular expressions. So say that I say, okay, star keyword, this means zero or more keywords. So all those three vectors with zero, one, or two elements, they're all valid. But if I use plus, then it needs to be at least one. So the first one is invalid. And if I use question mark, it needs to be one at most, so the last one is invalid. So this is the same as, as you would uh, have in regular expressions. Um, CAT stands for concatenate. Basically, just means first this, then that. You can you can put a sequence of things after each other. Uh, so here I'm saying first a number, then a keyword. And so that map conforms, and then I get I, I need to give those num and keydar are names that I've chosen, which are then used when you conform that value to get uh, a new value. Um, and look at that map. That's that's really amenable to destructuring. So like I said, this is all this makes it easier for, for processing later on. Uh, alt, alternatives. So this is like the, the vertical bar, the pipe in regular expression. It's either this or it's that. So here, uh, what you get back is a, a map entry, which is kind of like a, a two-element vector. Um, and this is actually really handy to, uh, to consume with core match, with pattern matching. You can say, OK, if the first element's a num, then branch here. If the first element's key, then branch there. Um, and you can, you can mix and match all of these. So here is, again, the, the spec that I had for ingredients. So I'm saying that um, 
a list of ingredients is zero or more times, and then a concatenation of number unit name, which are a number, a keyword, and a string. And so notice that this, this consumes a flat vector. It's not that I have you know, vectors with three elements inside that vector. This is a flat sequence, um, just like a string is always a flat sequence. A, a regular expression in closure spec consumes a flat sequence. Uh, you can put specs in there to, to nest, but by itself, it, it consumes that as, as one sequence. And so the, the middle part is the, the input that I'm giving to conform, and then the bottom part is what comes out of conform. This is the, the reshaped value that I get by applying that spec. Um, I need to start speeding up here, but uh, you can instrument functions with fdef, saying that, say I have a cook function, cook function takes a recipe, and I don't know what exactly it calculates, maybe the amount of calories in the end, so it returns a number. Um, so I can say, okay, well, this function cook takes, has as an argument list uh, a recipe, it needs to return a number, and then when you turn on instrumentation, then uh, whenever you call cook with a different argument, with anything that doesn't conform, then spec will throw an exception and you know early on that something's wrong. You can turn it on per namespace. So this is stuff you would do during development. Um, and then macros, like I already pointed out briefly, macros are really just functions, but they're functions that run earlier on to transform a part of your syntax tree. So you can instrument those as well, write specs for them, what kind of shape needs to go in here, what comes out of it. Um, and so Clojure already, since alpha 11, contains uh, specs for, for let, if let, defn, ns. So you just turn on that instrumentation and automatically you get checks of all of that stuff. And then finally, again, I don't have the time to, uh, to explain this in detail, but this is then using test check. So test check is a library. You do have to pull that in. So closure spec comes shipped with closure itself. Um, but test check is a separate library. You need to pull that in as a separate dependency. Um, but given that, you get this property-based testing. So here I'm saying that um, for, for each recipe that you can generate, for any valid recipe, the output of the cook function should be greater or equal than zeros. And then we can run that 100 times on 100 different generated recipes, and it'll run that until it fails, find an example that fails, and then try to make that example simpler and gives you back you know, the most reduced, smallest case that makes your test fail. So this is really a, a very powerful way of testing. So to recap, what spec really gives us is a shared vocabulary. So from now on, libraries plus closure core, we all get this shared vocabulary of expressing what do we expect from our data. Uh, they combine and compose so you can build up complicated specs. Uh, you can even spec say, uh, I haven't really gone into that, but with the fdef, when you have functions, they also generate functions. So they will uh, generate a function that that returns a generated value of the given type, and that again can be a function which generates like, you know, the, the rabbit hole is, is infinite. Um, I went into key specs and, and reject specs. I think those are particularly interesting, but there's, there's many more uh, in closure spec. You should check that out. Uh, you can validate, conform, uh, get runtime check, and to some extent, compile time check. And then finally, it's really good for generative testing. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. I think we have time for like uh, two quick questions, if you have them. Yep. Hi. So I I heard you said that uh, it's spec is uh, used for uh, runtime checking, but uh, could you instead use it for uh, after uh, you get an error, like a runtime error, uh, to uh, give some better... Um, I mean, you can use it, so with the, the instrumentation of functions is something that typically you would do at runtime um, in development mode. 
but but really, like I showed, like they're just functions that you can call and that you can get creative with. Um, so if if you get uh, an error somewhere and you you can get a hold of you know the value, uh, do a PR on STR or something on the value that went into somewhere, you can you can then maybe run that value through your existing specs to see like okay maybe we had a bad value there. Um, you can also just leave it on at runtime or or in in uh, in in production if you like. It's going to slow down a bit. You might get uh, some errors where the system actually would have just carried on. Um, that's that's kind of up to you. Uh, but you can also really just consume it as a library. So you can also just say like, okay, we get API requests coming in. We're gonna run those to spec to see that they aren't sending us gibberish. Uh, so yes, you, there there are things you could do there. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, yeah, I was I meant like uh, if you don't want to run it. Uh, in your server, but uh, if you get the stack trace and you would normally put just the stack trace in the server log, then you could uh, add some more uh, information about the data. Yeah, so I mean that's that's what I'm saying, right? Like if you instead of a stack trace, if there you can get uh, the the actual values at the point where you got an error, like say you know what what actual values got got passed into this function that that caused the thing to blow up you know if if your and if your application state is a, is an atom is a single value or something and you can grab that and you can validate that with your spec then yeah that's that's basically what you're doing yeah thank you okay uh, i think there would be lots of questions about uh, uh spec but uh please poke arne uh in the yeah, next I'll next break i'll be around i have stickers uh come and talk to me Thanks, Arne.